Hi, I'm John Dickinson, the founder of CodeKen.com, and this is our Dive Into Test Driven Development screencast using the JUnit testing framework. In this screencast, we will go through a hands-on example of using test driven development to create a basic implementation of a shopping basket. Test driven development is the process of writing an automated unit to test to confirm precisely what production code we need to implement. Each new test defines a new behavior of the software to be implemented. By defining our expectations of the software first, we ensure that we develop the minimum amount of code to meet the requirements of the system. Also, driving our production code through tests helps to keep the design of our code clean as we need to be able to exercise each area independently to ensure we can test it in isolation of the rest of the system. In addition, the tests we write form a living document that describes all the features and functions of the system. Through use of descriptive method names and by keeping our test code as simple and legible as possible, the unit tests act as a functional definition of the code. Each test describes a discrete behavior of the system and gives future developers an insight into our code and a deeper understanding of the code. We refer to tests as living documentation because they are tied to the production code base and so, as long as the tests are passing, then we will always be correct. This is in stark contrast to external documentation that is completely disconnected from the code. When following a test-driven approach, you end up with a much larger amount of test code than production code. This is inevitable as setting up the test scenarios for each path of production code takes many more lines of code than making the tests pass. Due to the amount of tests that you will have to write and maintain over the course of a project, it pays dividends to keep the code as clean and as simple as possible. Test-driven developers pay as much attention to keeping their test code clean as their production code because they know that hard to maintain tests will slow their productivity just as much as a poorly designed as poorly designed production code. During the course of this screencast, we will keep a close eye on our tests and refactor them often to make it easy to keep adding tests quickly. As I mentioned, we are going to implement a semi-realistic example shopping basket. We have the following requirements for our basket. We want to be able to add items to the basket, and by doing this we'll, uh, we'll have a basic introduction to JUnit tests and assertions. Uh, we'll then get the total price of items in the basket, and this will provide an example of defining the interface of our production code through tests. Um, then uh, we, uh, we're going to want to make sure that we cannot add products to the basket with a negative price so we'll do some validation and uh, through that feature we'll show how to write tests to handle exceptions uh, then we'll stop adding new features for a moment to see how we can clean up our tests to make it easier to manage them um, after that we'll apply sales tax to the basket and then when adding this behavior to the basket, we will show how we can avoid big design up front and use the tests we write as a safety net that allows us to evolve our system as new requirements come to light. Then we'll add different types of products to the basket by again showing how to use tests to drive the, de the design of the code. And then finally, we'll allow the basket to handle promotions However, at this point, we'll not actually implement any promotions. Instead, we will create a test that defines how a basket interacts with promotions. So the first thing we need to do is write a test. We'll create a test class called basket test. This class lives in a test source directory separate from our production code. We don't want to deploy our test code along with the production code, so keeping the tests in a separate directory 
makes it easier to avoid deploying test code to a production environment. JUnit test methods are identified by three parts in their method signature. First off, the method must have a test annotation. In addition, it must be public and the method must be void. To add items to a basket, we need to first instantiate the basket. So first thing we'll do is create a test that will instantiate that basket. And uh, here you can see we're driving out the interface of the basket. You notice that we will call basket, but it doesn't exist yet. We'll use IntelliJ's refactoring tools to generate the basket in the source directory. There we are, there's a basket. Now we run the test, we'll see it execute and we should see it pass. Now we need to add items to the basket and confirm that they've been added. To do this, we will create an add method and we'll just add Java objects because we have no requirements as to what type of thing should be added. Then we'll use the JUnit assert equals method to verify that the basket is behaving as expected. Assert equals defines the expectation of the test. In this test, we expect the basket to contain two items. If it doesn't, then JUnit will fail the test and it'll report the reason for the failure. Now we need to go and implement the interfaces that we defined on our basket test so that we can actually add items to the basket and verify the size of the basket. So now that we've done that, we need to import the assert equals method. Uh, and once we get the interface right, because we're still missing the correct return type, um, so we do that. And now we should be able to run the test. So once that's done, we'll run the test and, um, and we can see that the test should fail. So there we are. The test has failed because the ex we expected two items to be returned to the basket, but instead zero items got returned. So let's, let's go to our basket now and make the test pass. So the first thing we need to do is make the basket uh, retain a list of items. Um, so obviously the add method just needs to add an item to the member variable we've created. And then if we return the size of those items, that should meet the requirements of our test. So it really is as simple as that, and it's a case of doing the smallest amount of work to get the test to pass. So now we can see the test passed. We've completed the first requirement of the basket. We can store the list of items, and through our tests we've verified uh, that the basket will return the correct number of items. The next requirement we have is to get the total price of all the items in the basket. To do this, I'm going to need to add items to the basket that have got a numeric price property rather than just Java objects. So we'll use the test to drive out the interface of these objects because so we want to create products um, and we're going to say a product takes a big decimal because we don't want uh, rounding or precision errors so a big decimal will do the job there um, once we've defined the products the, the requirements of the test the data setup of the test if you like we then need to define the expectation 
and we want to verify that the total method returns uh, the sum of the two items that we've added to the basket. So then we go off and implement the interface, saying that the total obviously must return big decimal. And now we can run the tests, and they should fail. So now that the tests are failing, we can go and provide the implementation and write our production code. So we're not storing objects anymore. We need to be storing products because we need to get access to that prize property. So we'll retain, we'll, we'll allow add, uh, products to be added to the basket. And then we've got to implement the total method. So if we just iterate through the items in the basket, um, and then as we iterate over, sorry, I'll just finish typing this out. As we, as we iterate over uh, the items, we'll keep a running total of the uh, of the basket and then obviously we'll need to we need to sum uh, so we can use the interface on big decimal to add the values together as we iterate over them now once we've got that running total we can just return it now we've still got to implement uh, the price property on the product. And so once we've done that, we'll just make sure the constructor can take it, that's great. So once we've done that, we should now be able to run our test and the test should pass. Excellent, there we go. We're going to take a look at another feature of JUnit now. So far we've seen how to define a test and perform assertions on the expected results of running our code. As well as assert equals, JUnit allows you to verify particular exceptions are thrown under certain conditions. So we're going to add a validation rule to our add method on basket to ensure a product with a negative price cannot be added to the basket. So to do this, the first thing we need to do is write a test method. So we're going to write a method that says the basket does not accept products with a negative price. So again we need to set up our test data, so we need to create a basket. Um, and then we need to add a product to the basket. Now, this product is going to have to have a negative price because uh, although that's a string, I need to, to be a big decimal. So this product's got to have a negative price because that defines the, the behavior for the test. So the way that we verify the behavior uh, is in JUnit, you can put expectations on the test annotation that a particular exception will be thrown. So here we've said this test should um, expect the illegal argument exception to be thrown. Um, and so that then implies that when we go and implement the add method on basket, if there's a big decimal with a negative number, we've got to throw that exception. So now that we've got our test, let's go and run it and make sure we're failing for the right reasons. So now we've run the test and we can see we can see that the uh, the assertion error is that we expected the illegal argument exception and we obviously didn't get it. So now we can go into our add method and implement the right behavior. Uh, so this is just as I mentioned before a simple case of checking the um, checking the value of the price and then depending upon the value of the price if it's less than zero throwing an exception 
uh, specifically an illegal argument exception. And we'll pop the message in there to make it clear the re to, to any users, any clients of this, uh, of this class, what the actual problem was. So now we run the test and we should see that it'll pass because when the, the test conditions that we set up should meet this criteria and then should force uh, the exception to be thrown, which will meet the expectations of the test. Now, we should also check the boundary case in this condition. So, uh, and the boundary case would be that the basket does accept a product um, when the price is zero. So obviously negatives, no good. Positives, we've already got tests that verify that, but we haven't got anything that checks that zero is acceptable, is an acceptable price. So again, we'll set up our test data. We've got baskets. Uh, we need to add a product to the basket and we're going to say this product has got a new big decimal price of zero. Um, and this time we shouldn't get an error. So there's no need to define our um, exceptional case, uh, the expectation with the exception class. This time we just say, well, when we sum the basket or when we get the total of the basket, it's going to be a big decimal of zero because there's only one item in there. Now this should pass straight away brilliant it does so um, but we've just now got a test that verifies that expectation before we move on to our next feature um, let's take a look at some cleanup that we can do in our tests because uh, there's a couple of parts um, of, of creating our setup test data that's becoming a little onerous. Um, so for example, we're always having to create a new basket each time and that just takes time to type that line out. And um, because we're using big decimal in the interface of products, it's uh, a little verbose for us to create a product uh, and we're creating uh, multiple products in each test. So we'll take a look at a couple of ways that we can make our tests a little tighter, uh, which will help us move faster through the rest of the tutorial. Um, so the first, the feature of JUnit that we're going to look at to help uh, help with the refactoring is the the before and after annotations. Um, so we use before and after to specify code that should provide common setup state, and then. Uh, clean down any unwanted state after the tests have ran. So the before annotation um, goes on a method that you would like to be executed before each test that's run. And the after annotation goes on a method that you would like to be executed after each test method has been run. Um, so we'll show, we'll go through an example of how that works now. So here we have uh, our basket setup, which happens uh, in every single test. So we'll just do um, a bit of refactoring, use IntelliJ refactoring to pull that out into a field which is instantiated in the setup method. Um, now you can see here that the, as I was saying, the before annotation goes on, uh, goes on a method uh, in the same way as the test annotation does. And this method has to be public and it has to be void in the same way as the test method does. But what happens is this test, this setup method is executed before each of the individual test methods that's run. So when, uh, when uh, IntelliJ runs or when JUnit runs, the items can be added to the basket method. Before that, it'll run the setup method. And then when it comes on to run basket, it can be calculated uh, sorry, can calculate the total cost of the basket, then it'll run the setup method, method before that as well. So we can see that by uh, taking this, putting the basket instantiation into this common setup method, we've removed at least well, one line from each of our tests, which is, uh, which is a, a, a good overhead to get rid of. And once we've made that refactoring, we, um, we need to run our tests again just to make sure that we haven't broken anything, which we haven't, of course. 
As I mentioned, the other part of setting up our test data that's quite onerous at the minute is uh, creating a new product. So every time we have to create a new product, we have to create a new big decimal and give it a value. So if we can just uh, abstract that into a simple helper utility method within the test that will allow it to, us to create products giving us given a string value for their price, then that will make our tests a lot faster, um, writing, authoring our tests a lot faster. So here you can see we've used the uh, IntelliJ refactoring tools just to um, extract a method called product that will return a product instance and all we have to do is pass in the string value. Now that we've cleaned up our tests a bit, uh, we can move on to adding sales tax to the basket. Now we'll start off uh, by just hard coding this to 20% because that's uh, assume we're only selling goods in the UK. Um, so that's what the clients asked us to produce. Um, so to start us off, we implement a test saying basket adds sales tax to the total. Um, so now it's much faster for us to write these tests. We can just go basket, add products with the amount, and then we can easily add two products to the basket. And, um, and now we're going to introduce a new method on the basket. So we're going to assert that the big decimal, so the price that we're going to get back is instead 48. Um, and that's because we're going to ask for the basket with the sales tax included. So notice that I've had to specify an expectation with four trailing zeros. Uh, this is to provide the same level of pre precision that will be used by the big decimal that is returned as a result of a multiplication operation. So now we'll go and implement the interface for the total with sales tax. Um, and we can run our test and see that it fails. And so in this case, it'll fail because the return value is null, but that gives us something to work from. So now we go into the total with sales tax method and we'll create the implementation. Uh, we're going to reuse the total method, obviously, because we don't want to sum it all again. Um, but this time we're just going to apply a static sales tax of 20% to the total that's returned. And then very simply, we've got our implementation, run the test again, and it should pass. Now, for our test purposes, I would like a convenience comparator method that checks for uh, comparative equality on big decimal rather than basing the equality on precision. Uh, so this will make the tests simpler to write and also easier to read at first glance. So for example, if you're coming to look at these tests for the first time, it'll be a little bit confusing if, you, um, if you're uh, confronted with 48.0000. So we want to be able to define the expectations of the test in a language that will be easy for uh, a new developer to come in and, and, and pass and understand. So to do that, we'll go through the few refactoring steps. We'll pull out the, the big decimal for the expectation um, and we'll pull out the, the actual value um, as variables. Then we can use the IntelliJ refactor or extract method refactoring. Um, and that will will create a new method called compare. So at the moment, when we first create this, it looks exactly the same. All it's doing is an assert equals. Um, but instead of just doing the assert equals, we're going to change the um, we're going to change the behavior of this compare method to actually do a, a big decimal compare. So first of all, we'll, we'll, pop them, um, we'll pop the big decimals back in line because we don't want them to be pulled out in our test again. Uh, it's more confusing to have them declared as variables. Um, and now we will change the behavior of the assertion that we're performing. 
Uh, but first of all, obviously, we want to rename some stuff. So the the expected is the value is the first value that comes through, and then the second value is going to be actual. So we want these tests to be literate, to be easy to understand. And so now we will instead use the compare to method on big decimal, which if we uh, if we pass through forty eight point zero zero and we actually get 48.0000000, no matter how many, it'll be the same because they are actually the same number, they've just got different precisions. Okay, great, so we can see that test passing, the refactor's been done, so now the tests uh, read a little easier. Now at this point we do have a potential problem which I'm going to illustrate by breaking the expectation of the test. Um, so the problem is we are going we have lost a lot of the information that is provided by the assert equals comparison we were doing before. So previously if we were returning the wrong number, assert equals uh, the wrong value, assert equals would have told us what we expected to come back but what and what we actually got back, um, and that was very that's very useful for debugging uh, the code and figuring out where we've gone wrong. However, now we've got a method that doesn't quite do that. It gives us something different. So all it's doing is it's checking against the result of a compare to operation. And the result of a compare to is either one if it's greater than zero if it's the same, or negative one if it's less than, and that's not very useful. Um, so instead, what we need to do is we need to put back, put a message back in that will be meaningful to the tester. So we really want to be able to say what information was expected and what was actually returned. And then it's back to being as useful as it was before. Okay, so we've put that message in. Now, if we run the test again, uh, this is just our broken test, we should see that there's a, a relatively useful message. So we expected 47, but we've got 48.0000. Um, so now, if we put our test back, make the test correct again, then we will see that um, it will also pass again as it should. So for handling sales tax in our basket, we've created a fairly naive implementation that will only deal with 20% sales tax. Now, say the client decides that they want, or the customer decides that they want to have um, or sell abroad, sell to different, uh, to different countries that have different sales taxes. So now they're asking that they can apply a variable sales tax to the basket. So again, We'll start with a test, um, and this test will define or say that the basket um, can use. This test will say that the basket can use an arbitrary sales tax to calculate the total of the basket. So again, we can see it's much easier for us to create our products now. Um, so we've got our two products, each at 20, 20 pounds, 20, 20 dollars, 20 whatevers. Um, and, uh, and we're going to create our expectation by comparing, saying this should be 44. And if we say this time a basket can have a total with sales tax. And the simplest way we can do this is just by passing in a new value, a new sales tax. So we'll do that um, and we'll say that well, we need to create the new interface for that method, but this, by by driving that uh, that behavior out through the tests, it lets us think from the client's perspective of the code, lets us think, well, what's the simplest way that we can do this? So we don't go overthinking, over-architecting the code. We simply just say, well, well, I've got a sales tax from somewhere else. I want to pass it in and have that applied to the basket. So now obviously this test is going to fail, 
uh, because again we're returning null but it will give us the the expectation that we can then go and implement so here we can see the tests failed um, and there's no need to go back to the test we can e we can simply just say well we will execute the total and we'll multiply it by the new sales tax because we've already been through this sort of process before and we'll see that it passes now now we should see in here that we've got some duplicated code some duplicated logic so there's two places where we're applying sales tax to total so we can now just in our hard-coded version we can apply the 20% sales tax through the new method that we've created and of course after we make the change we must run the tests to make sure everything's still passing which it is and then we can um, take a look at that that hard-coded sales tax because it's a bit of a magic number we don't really know what it means so we should create a constant out of it um, so let's do that now it could be the, uh, the the default sales tax say and then once we perform this refactoring we run the test again make sure everything's fine great everything's still passing so that's the end of adding sales tax to the basket So now we've been asked to add uh, different types of products to the basket. So currently all we can add is just the generic product. Um, but the, uh, the customers decided that they want to sell books and videos. So we will drive that out through the test and just say that we've got a test that says different types of products can be added to the basket. So we'll create these two different uh, products again through defining uh, the test criteria so we say basket add a book basket add a video um, and then once we've declared those two interfaces we can then say that we expect the basket to be able to sum these two uh, different types of product so a book, the, the value of a book can be added to the value of a video and that'll give you the total of the basket. So now we've got our test and our expectations. We obviously can't run this test until we make it compile. So let's go off and create the book and video classes. So here's our book class. And then we'll create the video class. Um, and then each of these classes has got to have a constructor, obviously. Uh, now here we've gone and passed the string in, and actually that should that should really be a big decimal. Um, so we will change that in the uh, in the interface definition, well through the, the test expectation, if you like, and then we'll use the IntelliJ refactoring tools to to generate the constructor based on the new type that we're passing in. So here's just another example of when you're using refactoring tools, how useful it can be to drive the interface of the code out through a test client. Right, so we've done book, now we've done video. Great, so we've got the interfaces that we want. Now, obviously there's a problem on, um, on the basket add method because the add method only takes products. So there's a few different steps we could take here. Um, I think the simplest thing that we could probably do is make book and video just extend product. Because at the moment there's no difference in the behavior, so we don't need to give it any, give them any more attributes, that'll probably come in the future. But for now, if we just say they're both products, then everything will work just fine. So we've done book, now we'll go on and make video extend product. Okay. 
So now we've got a compiling test and we can uh, we can run all of our tests and and we'll see what we get. There we go. That just works because both of them they're both just product types. So no change to make that happen. Now the reason that we added products to the basket was that um, the customer wants to be able to add or apply promotions to a basket. So we'll go and we'll start fleshing this out through the test. Um, so first of all, a simple test saying a saying no, not a uh, when a promotion um, is added to the basket. then it can affect the price of the basket. So what we're going to do here is we'll create a, a promotion interface because we're going to define promotions that can be applied to the basket as an interface, as an external thing. And this will allow us to test the interaction between a basket and a promotion. So rather than having to implement concrete rules that we don't have yet, we'll be able to say, well, when we give this promotion to the basket, then it performs in a certain way. So we'll create the, um, create the basket by adding a book and a video to the basket. So we've fallen in the same problem with book here that we did with um, with product before. It's quite uh, it's quite onerous to create a uh, or add a book to a basket. So we'll do the refactoring now to create a book method because we've got a couple of places where it's happening. So this is all about keeping our tests simple. And then once we've done that, we need to add a we're going to add a, a video to the basket. So again, this is another type, and we're going to have the same problem again. So it's getting, you know, it's it's onerous. There's lots of typing to be able to add a video to the basket. So we'll do the same thing. We'll extract um, a method to handle uh, the creation of videos to make that simpler. So again, using the IntelliJ refactoring tools, we uh, we pull out the, that that hard coded value into a variable, a local variable. Then we call the extract method. Uh, operation and um, and now we've got a video method that will that we can use to create videos easily okay now on with the rest of the test so we've got a basket that we can add products to but now we're going to say we can set a single promotion on the basket now it may be that in the future there'll be multiple promotions but we'll start with the simplest possible case so we set the promotion. Now, because it's an interface, what we can do is we can provide our own. Uh, now, this is a mocked or stubbed, rather, implementation of an interface. Sorry, a mocked implementation of an interface. Um, and what it will allow us to do, well, we'll see later on. We'll finish setting the test up first. So we're saying we're adding, we've got a book and a video going in at 20, 20 pounds each, and then we'll do a compare on the total of the basket and say that there's actually some money off one of those. So there's a we expect 39 pounds to come out. Um, so what we'll do here is when we apply the promotion to a particular product, well, we're saying if we apply the promotion to a particular type of product, in this case, it is a uh, to a video, we're saying there's a promotion of, instead of it being whatever it is, it's going to be £19. Now, what we're doing here is defining the behavior of how we expect a basket to interact with a promotion. So we're saying that a promotion has an interface, which is apply to a product. And by setting the promotion on the basket, and then defining the behavior of the promotion 
in this test. And then later on, setting the expectation of what effect that should have on the basket. We're then designing the uh, the basket implementation that we that we that we expect to happen. So we can't do that until we've got this set promotion method. So we'll go and we'll we'll add that to the interface now, so that we can store a promotion to be used later. But what we're essentially saying is, when the total is executed, or the total method is called, we expect the promotion to be called. Um, but we'll run our test for now. And we should see that it's failing, and we should see the values are just wrong. We expect 40, uh, 39 to pounds to be coming back, but we're going to get 40 pounds instead. So now we can go into the, the total method, and instead of just simply looping over all the products and summing them, we need to apply the promotion to each of the products. Now the promotion will be responsible for determining whether it applies to a product or not, um, and that's what we've done in our test case. Um, but um, but yeah, so we we part of the running total is is the result of applying the promotion to a product. Uh, but if there's no promotion, then it's just a case of adding the, the product. And once we run that test, we can now see that it passes. So just to go over again what we've done here with baskets and promotions and, um, and, and mocking. So we've got a basket that we've added a book and a video to. We've then set a promotion on the basket. And this is actually a mock of a promotion. It's not a real promotion that exists in our production code base. It's a mock that we have defined that says when the basket applies a promotion to a product if that product is a video then the price returned will be 19 otherwise it will be whatever the normal product price is so it's a very explicit rule that we can control it's 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 meaningless in the real world but it makes our test easier to understand and easier to define so therefore we can say with certainty in our expectation that the value that's returned from total should be 39 because it should be the unadjusted value of book which is 20 pounds and it should be the promotional price of video which we have declared within the test as being 19 pounds and the value of that approach is it allows us to without declaring without defining any promotions in the production code it allows us to verify the behavior of how a basket applies promotions to its contents. So you can imagine if we were to use a real promotion from the production code, say we had a real promotion implemented, and if we were to use one of those, if that promotion were to change in the future, then it would cause more than just the tests around that promotion to fail. It would also cause the basket promotions to fail which really isn't acceptable. You need all of the tests as much as possible to be isolated from each other. So if the behavior of, of the basket and promotions changes, then the basket test should, should fail or should change. But if the behavior of a specific promotion changes, then nothing else in the system should be affected. Now, the mocking is uh, is an incredibly useful technique, as we've described. But in the example that I created previously uh, for promotions, you can see that it's not the most elegant, the most readable way of um, of declaring behavior in a test. So we've got what is there five or six lines there, purely just to say when the product is a video, then apply this specific price to the promotion. There's there's a lot of cruft around that. Now that's um, if you if you're declaring mocks in this way, that's just a, a necessity of the Java language. That's really about as verbose as you can get it. Um, so 
the alternative to declaring your mocks manually like this in a, as I say, very verbose way. And actually, just as a quick side note, this is a relatively lean uh, implementation because promotion only has one interface, uh, one interface method. Imagine what this would look like if it had four, five, six, or more. Then you would have many, many methods in there that weren't even being used. So you'd have a lot of noise within your tests. And our goal is to keep the tests clean, keep them simple to understand. So this isn't really a scalable approach to mocking. Now, thankfully, many people have realized this before, uh, and there are a number of libraries out there specifically for mocking, to make mocking easier, uh, easier to do, easier to understand, easier to read. Now, the library that, um, that I like to use is called Makito. So I'm going to give you a very, very quick uh, taster of Mikito um, just by replacing the test behavior that we've got already and, um, and using Mikito to, to implement it instead. So this is the Mikito site. Uh, there's lots of information on how to use it. Um, you can get a quick overview of how to write mocks and stubs and verify the behavior on the mocks. Um, and um, but for now, let's just have a quick look at how we can use Makito to improve the readability of this test. So I've already downloaded the Makito library and I've imported it into my class path. But what we're going to do here is we're going to create a mock promotion, which is really what we've already done. But we'll use the Makito library to do this. So we can create a the language to create a mock promotion is as simple as mock promotion class uh, with a static import method on Makito. And we can now, now that we've got that mock promotion, we can define behavior on it. So we can say things like when, and we'll import that, that's another Makito method. So they've got a very literate interface for this. So when mock promotion uh, apply to, so that's the, that's the apply to method is called. So when that method is called with a class of a particular type, so when it's called with um, the class of the type video, uh, yeah, where, so when we call mock promotion apply to video class, then return, and we can say here return the big decimal of 19 that we've done in our in our other mock uh, in our static mock if you like um, so that's this behavior highlighted here so then we also need to provide behavior for anything else I think we'll do it for a book but it's essentially for anything else um, but because we know that we're passing our book in then we'll say actually it's going to be 20 Oh, I've done that as 200. We'll come back in a minute. Um, and so now we can set the basket promotion as mock promotion. So we can see already that this is much cleaner because we're declaring our basket with the handsets. We've got a mock promotion and then we're declaring the behavior that should apply to the the the, the, the promotion should perform when each of the different um, variables is passed through or the different types is passed through. Now the other thing that we've got here is we've got some sort of magic numbers, uh, well not magic numbers but slightly brittle tests in that if we change the value of the book in one place um, and then didn't change it in the other place, then our tests would start failing. So we can just do a little bit of tidy up there to make um, to make them a little less brittle. But that's a really basic introduction to uh, to Mokito. The next tutorial I'm going to do on TDD is all about mocking, and we'll use the Mokito library uh, to to go through how what to how to do mocking and when to do it. So we'll look at when to do, when to mock behavior, when to stub behavior, when to verify calls, and all the different tricks uh, that Makito provides um, when you're uh, 
when you when you need to uh, provide mocking behavior in your tests. That's the end of this dive into test-driven development screencast. Before we finish, I'll review what we covered in this session and then give you some resources to learn more about test-driven development. The key thing to remember about test-driven development is that you write the tests first. Be clear about your goals and expectations before writing production code and remember to try and call the result of the test before you run it. By writing the tests first, we can drive the design of our code through the tests. Designing code this way helps us to keep it simple and free of side effects as we try and isolate each part of the code to be tested individually. Anecdotal evidence suggests that projects that use test-driven development typically have two to three times as much test code as production code. If you want to keep delivering software at a constant rate, you need to pay attention to the quality and cleanliness of your test code to ensure maintenance of this code doesn't slow you down. Writing our tests first will give us a high level of test coverage in our production code. This allows us to refactor our code with confidence that we will not break the behavior of the code and so helps to keep our production code clean. We also covered a brief introduction to mocking and saw how you can use mocking to isolate the behaviors of the software that you want to test and insulate your tests from changes in other areas of the system. I'll cover mocking in more detail in the upcoming screencast, Dive Into Mocking. To find out when this will be available, either email me, john at codeken.com, or go to the codeken.com website and sign up to our newsletter. This is the first screencast produced by CodeKen. I'm planning many more in the future and would love some feedback about what you liked and what you were not so keen on in this video. Maybe there's a particular technology or programming technique you'd like us to cover. Either way, you can get in touch with me by emailing john at codeken.com. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.